Light is ephemeral, be it natural or artificial. Light is invisible until it touches a surface, object, or interacts with particles in the air. Light has a profound effect on us, both in a visual and a non-visual way. It can affect our mood, our health, perception, our local environment, the wider global environment, the world we live in, how we live, and how we work. We can change a space using light. We can alter it, alter how it's used or how it performs. Architectural lighting design is a creative extension of architecture, complementing form, program, and color. I would argue it's the most important aspect of the whole design process. And I'd also say it's one of the most important considerations for life for our health and for our well-being. I personally think light should be on prescription. <laughs> so as Jan mentioned, I'm primarily an architectural lighting designer. I work with both natural and artificial lights, usually on a permanent basis, to enhance spaces and the world we live in and for the users who occupy them. Light is my medium, my tool, my way of telling stories or conveying a narrative to influence mood or behavior, emphasize, enhance, or describe space. As to where my journey with light began, well, it's complicated, and probably one for another day. But suffice to say, it includes art college, number of universities, lots of studying, an eclectic ensemble of concerts, a bit of rock and roll, a passion for architecture in the built environment, a little bit of TV work, a lot of creatively blowing stuff up, <laughs> a smattering of Hollywood, too many site safety inductions and far too many meetings, probably a bit of hearing loss and a number of chance encounters, one of which led to a phone call, a lucky break, and a new career in London. So I returned to Winchester in 2006 and set my own practice up, and I've become fascinated by the power of light to manipulate us, to comfort us, to shock us, and even to heal us. My awe at the power of light to influence our mood, our experience, has never waned, and neither has my curiosity to explore why we have this intrinsic link. So everything I do is about light in one way or another. So why light? Well, we've established that I've made a career out of it, um, and I've been fascinated by it my whole life. But believe it or not, it's actually the oldest profession known to man. According to the history books, which I believe this one <laughs> is a bit of a bestseller, we see there was a lighting designer before people even walked to the earth. But no matter what your religion, religious or not, creation or evolution, there is one thing that cannot be denied, and that is light. So while our ancestors have been around about six million years, modern humans have only been around about 200 years. And the only light back then was daylight, and, when they discovered it, fire. Modern lamps, oil lamps using animal fats, weren't invented until around 17,500 BC. And candles have only been around since Roman times. But even as late as the 1700s, we were still using candles and oil lamps as a source of light, artificial light, once the sun had gone down. Electric light was only invented in the 1800s. So this light that we are used to today has only been around seconds in, time, in terms of our whole evolution. So why am I telling you this? 
Well, as many of you probably know, our bodies have a built-in circadian rhythm, which is controlled by external cues, and the most important of those is daylight. In the modern 24-hour, artificially lit environments we live in, these daylight cues are often lost or misinterpreted, and this plays havoc with our circadian rhythms. Remember back to our timeline of evolution, this is all relatively new to us. At base level, it's obviously directly linked to sleep disruption and deprivation. However, recently, and more worryingly, it's been directly linked to more serious illnesses, especially in the case of shift workers and those who regularly disrupt the sleep-wake cycle. It's even been suggested that it could be connected with sleep disorders, gastrointestinal mood and cardiovascular disorders, and even some types of cancer. So to neglect your circadian rhythms is a really serious issue. So our body's circadian rhythm is controlled by external cues, the most important of which is daylight. And it receives this information as we know it via our eyes. Now, there are three types of photoreceptor in mammalian eyes. Rods, cones, and intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of rods and cones. Cones kick in in higher ambient levels. Your cones and rods are sort of going a bit like this at the moment because there's a bit of everything going on in here. But generally, your, at, your cones kick in in ambient levels, and they are split up into red, green, and blue cones. Now, if you're deficit in one of those types of cones, then that is when you can have color blindness to certain colors. Your cones detect how light falls onto a surface. Don't forget light is invisible until it touches a surface or interacts with particles in the air. Your cones then build up this information of this light on surfaces, feed that to our brains, and we build up a picture of our surroundings. Rods are hypersensitive. They can detect a single photon of light. And they are more gray, more sort of grayscale, if you like. Think of those as our night vision cameras. Now, that third photoreceptor I mentioned, the retinal ganglion cell, contains a protein called melanopsin, and that is affected by blue light wavelengths. So you can start to see that with all this sensing and detecting going on, light has a really important part in our lives. But this goes much deeper, back to those caveman days, deep within our psyche and this programming over years and years of evolution. Remember, in our time scale of evolution, this light's only been around seconds. LED lights, which these are, some of those up there, they have been around milliseconds. We've, we've barely got used to them. We still crave those campfires, those oil lamps, all with that natural, warm glow. To most of us, our homes are our caves, where we go for sanctuary to rest and recover. We, go, we, we wake up in them at the start of the day. We go out to work, which would have been foraging for food. When the sun's up, the daylight's bright, you've got full spectrum of white light with the blue light as well to wake you up and make you productive. Then when the sun goes down, we return home, back to our caves, for sanctuary, to rest and recover. If we needed a, fire, a light at that time, we'd light a fire the lovely warm glow reflecting around the cave. Now, I've already mentioned blue light, but the reason it is so bad, and the light from screens, televisions, phones, and full spectrum lighting at the wrong time of day triggers that melanopsin, which then tells our bodies, wake up, go hunting, go to work, do this. So if you start looking at your phone at 10 o'clock at night, your body's going, what the hell's going on? The sun's gone down, but I'm being told to wake up. And that's where the issues really start to arise. But it's not just the blue light, it's the lighting type, location, and light source. Are getting these, all these things correct are key factors. Now, while I've been alluding to interior lighting, I haven't mentioned exterior lighting. And that might seem a bit weird initially, because, well, what's so special about exterior lighting? Because 
by lighting up the outside, surely we're going to have a more biophilic natural connection. But by the nature of lighting up the outside world, we're actually fighting the natural order of things. Don't forget, all animals and plants have a built-in circadian rhythm. So we need to consider the impact of these interventions. Their effects not only on us, but our surroundings and the wider global environment. What we do in our gardens, to our public realms, to our parks and our spaces, can have a knock-on effect on the rest of the um, world and the environment. And other issues, such as flickering glare, which lights can cause, can also be damaging and dangerous. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all doom and gloom. But as an industry, we are professional practitioners of this. We understand where the mistakes are made. We understand where people get it wrong. And it's usually those outside our profession that cause the problems. So one thing I would say to you is try and adopt a mantra of the right light in the right place at the right time. What are you lighting? Why are you lighting it? When does it need to be lit? Also remember, less is more, particularly at night. The human eye can see a candle from 1.6 miles away in darkness. Those rods kick in. Those detecting rods that are picking up that single photon of light. Poor quality light sources and mismatched lighting and control can also cause other issues, as flick, such as flicker, which I mentioned earlier. That is also very damaging and dangerous. And you can go away and do an experiment if you want. If you're getting headaches at home or work, you can take your phone out and use your digital camera and hold it up to the light. And if you've got bad lights in your house, you'll see them pulsing, because the frame rate in your camera will be working at a certain hertz level, and poor quality lights work at a lower hertz, so you'll be able to see that pulsing. I've bored my wife many times going into a restaurant, going, the lighting's, <laughs> the lighting's crap in here, and getting my phone out, and I'm, see, look. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I'm not peddling doom and gloom. Lighting up the outside world can be beautiful. It can enhance our parks, spaces, our lives. It can make them feel safer. Bring out unseen architectural elements. But we need to be careful. Used inappropriately, it can have a detrimental effect on our flora and fauna. Many animals, especially nocturnal animals, are adapted to low light conditions. Bats, in particular, have particular issues with light. The immediate obvious threat is predation. He's just simply more visible, so he can be eaten. And the effect of light in their eyes is very complex. However, in more simple terms, the insects are attracted to the light. So they go away from the feeding and roosting corridors, the bats follow them. And the bats that can cope with light, they've got a great meal. But the ones that can't, they starve. And an interesting, just go off on a slight tangent there, about insects. You might often see an insect flying around a light like this. They're actually flying upside down because they think the light is the sun, and they're trying to fly away from it, and they've constantly got their back to it, like that. But it's not just bats. or land-based animals. Lighting in and around our waterways can affect everything, its inhabitants and the eco-chain, and that has a domino effect on everything, including us. So be it daytime or nighttime, it can affect us all, and that quality of light is essential. And just think, if something is glary or bright or has adverse flicker in our eyes, imagine what it's like in the delicate eyes of our most loved pets. If you don't believe me, ask Porridge. <laughs> lighting can affect every living thing. So consideration of lighting is essential. So more natural lighting can be implemented in the home and workplace with a lighting system that's dynamic in both intensity and spectrum. And what I mean by this, very simply, the more you turn it up, the bluer and whiter it becomes. When you dim it down, it becomes warmer. Think of the sun coming up in the morning and setting at night. Exactly the same thing. We call it dim to warm. Or think of a fire. When a fire's really hot, it's white, it's blue, the light is so intense. And then when it dies down, the embers go red, and then it fades away and dies. We actually, interestingly, refer to the color of white light in lighting design by color temperature. 
and we also measure it in Kelvin. So we've established that light has a profound effect on us in both a visual and non-visual way. It can affect our mood, our physical and mental health, our local environment, the wider global environment, the world around us, and the animals we love. So remember, the right light in the right place at the right time. What, what is lighting? When is it needed? So this sounds really unachievable and complicated, but it isn't. Just take it back to basics. And I've given you this nice little checklist you can follow. Think of that warm, less intense light at the beginning of the day to start that sleep-wake cycle. Becoming stronger as the day goes on. More intense white light with loads of blue light in there to really get that melanopsin going, make you more productive, but then start to cancel it out as the day ends, bringing the light levels down, dimming the light level, reduce that blue light element at night. Think back to the cave as well. Light sources in your homes, low down, nice and relaxed. Think of the light bouncing off the surfaces. Why have a light in the ceiling at 10 o'clock at night? The sun's not going to be there, so your body's going, what the hell's that doing up there? <laughs> Think about light and shadow. Darkness is as much a part of light as light is of darkness. Think about layering light using different techniques, task, ambient, and accent. And finally, and the most important one, do you need to light at all? And if so, can you use more daylight? Can you use more natural light? Remember, natural light is the best light for us. And above all else, it's free. We all need and deserve good lighting in our lives. So hopefully, that's flicked a switch. <laughs>